you know, I was on a webinar recently and I heard a gastroenterologist talking about soil microbes. It was the very first time I had ever heard a gastroenterologist talk about soil health. And I thought, bingo, we need much more of this cross-pollination between the disciplines, right? So there's there's the study of human nutrition and we should be communicating with farmers and we should be communicating with physicians and teachers and you know people who de define or um, put school meals together and helping to understand how we feed children is so important to their long-term health. It's like I said, everything's connected. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from investigative nutritionist and host of the Food Sleuth radio show, Melinda Hemmelgarn. In this day where there is so much information available about what to eat, Melinda actually believes that we should be looking to organic farmers to make knowledgeable decisions about our diet and overall health. Let's return to my conversation with Melinda Hemmelgarn. I'm pleased today to be speaking with Melinda Hemmelgarn. Melinda has a master's in human nutrition and is the former director of the University of Missouri Nutrition Communication Center. Melinda is known widely in our organic community as the Food Sleuth radio host. She interviews scientists, farmers, and good food movement leaders to connect the dots between food, health, and agriculture, which is exactly what we do at the Real Organic Project. Good farming practices affect everything. Isn't that right? Everything. <laughs> Hi, Melinda. Hi. It's great to be with you and be a part of this great symposium, so thank you. Let's get started with um, health and nutrition and how you found organics. Right. So when I was working on my dietetics degree, um, we didn't talk about agriculture. And in fact, for most of my career, agriculture wasn't part of the picture. But I had a wonderful opportunity to do a food and society policy fellowship through the Kellogg Foundation. And that's really where I became introduced to and informed about the power of the way we produce our food. And it might sound crazy that that wouldn't be part of dietetics curriculum, but I think that's changing. You know, I graduated from college in 1978, so things were a bit different back then. Farming was certainly different back then. So uh, we've evolved. You know, nutrition is a relatively young science, but after working with farmers side by side and visiting their farms, I just, uh, it, it's a revelation. I think Wendell Berry was the one who said, you know, to, to think about food or to be curious about food and not the way it was produced is just ridiculous. Yeah, I think too, for the organic community, um, production practices in organic are so um, focused on uh, organic matter. And since the USDA kind of came in and, and defined it about kind of a list of approved and not approved additives, uh, that sort of changed the meaning a little bit. Maybe you could talk about what organic food means to you. And as an eater, what sorts of things should you be concerned about? Well, you know, I think the USDA makes it very easy to go online and read about what the definition is. And when I speak to dietitian audiences and consumer audiences, I like to help them understand what exactly is involved in that. But I think that um, certainly if I had a choice, I would rather that my food not be sprayed with toxic chemicals. I would prefer that the farmer took extra care to keep soil integrity and to focus on water quality and to have this overall intention of continuous improvement and the protection of biodiversity. That's so important, and I don't think it gets enough attention, but biodiversity equals resilience. And as we face more and more climate challenges, that biodiversity becomes ever more important, and we should be more focused on that. 
Um, certainly the use of antibiotics is extremely dangerous in agriculture. And I don't think that a lot of consumers understand that most antibiotics are used in livestock agriculture, not in medicine. I mean, there there is abuse, of course, in, in medicine where people might be prescribed antibiotics for a viral infection when they're not implicated. But I don't think many consumers understand that the bulk of antibiotics are used in livestock agriculture. So organic systems prohibit that. And the consumer might wonder, well, why is that? And it's mostly due to feed efficiency feed efficiency. So helping that animal gain weight faster, get to market faster. So that's dollars and cents for the farmer who's trying to, you know, make a living. Um, but for the consumer, we really don't want antibiotics used in our food. Um, and the reason for that is because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And that's just what bacteria do. They develop resistance to the, the, the compounds that are trying to kill them. And so I know we've talked before about how if you go into populations, there was a great study done in Iowa, for example, on veterans. And they found that those veterans who were living closest to confined animal feeding operations, they were more likely to carry methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus bacteria in their noses. So they become carriers of antibiotic resistant bacteria and they bring them, you know, into hospital settings. And if we buy meat from the industrial system, we should anticipate that there's going to be antibiotic resistant bacteria present on that meat as well. So that means our medicines aren't going to work for us, right? There's really nothing you can do if you have an infection and you have antibiotic resistance, resistant bacteria causing that infection. That's there's, a there's no way to treat it. That's exactly the risk. So we were so blessed in the 1940s when we got penicillin. It was a real game changer. You know, people used to die from getting everyday cuts or you take for granted that you can go in and you can have dental work or you can go and have a, you know, a heart valve replaced. And if you get a bacterial infection in the hospital, um, you can take an antibiotic and hopefully it works. But when we get antibiotic resistant infections and suddenly we're, we've run out of antibiotics that function well and work against that offending bacteria, then we start seeing death related to those infections. So it's very, very serious. It's one of the top five concerns listed among the CDC concerns, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The World Health Organization has also identified it as one of the biggest troubling issues facing our society. So how does antibiotics, how do they help animals gain weight? I have heard it connected to the loss of the gut microbiome in the animals. Do we know why? Do we understand this science, why they gain weight faster when they're on antibiotics? I am sure veterinarians could explain this. I don't think that I can, but... I don't think that's a problem because I actually, I'm not sure we truly understand it. My understanding is that we were giving them antibiotics when they, as a preventative when they were in these confined, like in CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations. So just as a preventative for disease, and then they noticed that they were gaining weight faster. And I think it just kind of shows how little we understand nutrition and maybe that connection um, between the, the bacteria that are in our di digestive system that we, you know, and animals too, that we then just killed off, that connection between health and, and the gut bacteria. But it just goes to show how little we know, you know, how, how has nutri nutrition science changed in your time? And do you feel like there's still a lot we don't understand? Oh, absolutely. You know, ironically, when I first graduated from college, I thought I knew everything. And then, you know, as the decades passed, I realized, oh my goodness, I know so little. But one thing for sure that we know, I, I think we can absolutely say without any question, is that everything is connected. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the One Health concept, this idea of looking at how humans and animals and land, land use, how everything is connected. And when we isolate or put, put issues in silos and we don't see how these connections are made, that's really when we run into trouble. Well, let's talk about CAFOs. You're kind of in the heart of, well, I guess GMO country that goes for the feed to then, you know, give to the confined animals. Um, 
This is one of the big wins of the organic movement is just getting away from this system. Let's, let's kind of dive in a little bit more deeply how it's connected to everything, water quality, soil health, climate. Yeah. That's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. And, you know, maybe, maybe the question to first start with is why don't I want a CAFO in my backyard? Why, doesn't, why shouldn't CAFOs exist, period? Uh, they shouldn't be in anyone's backyard. And from a social justice perspective, uh, the, the backyards where CAFOs are located are people who are mostly living in poverty and who don't have a voice. Many rural exploited communities, for example. So there's that whole social justice element of CAFOs. There's the animal, the, the humane welfare of animals component. And then there's also the environmental component. So if you're living near a CAFO, um, you can smell it. I always say, you know, anything that smells that bad, like that should be enough to say that something's not right. It stinks. And what the industrial farming community will say is, well, you know, it's the smell of money. Maybe you've heard that. I don't know. Um, you know, there, there are industries that are making money by exploiting rural communities and rural populations, but that's not the smell of money. It's the smell of exploitation. And it is such a shame uh, to be sitting outside in the country and realize I have to go inside because I, I can't stand the smell. I know people who have had to sell century farms. They've been in their families for decades and they have to move because they can't stand the smell or they have respiratory infections. That's huge. Children's asthma, for example. Um, yeah, it's not healthy to be in an area where animals are raised in CAFOs. Then there's water quality and how manure, there will be manure spills. You know, you, we see more storms, uh, powerful storms now with climate change. And we see manure pits spilling. The farmers that own these, these operations, they basically own the manure and then they have to sell the manure to farms, neighboring farms where they, they spread it. So you can smell it, it stinks, it gets in the water, it pollutes our water, it kills fish. If you like to go fishing, if you like to go swimming, you don't wanna be swimming in manure. Uh, and then of course the antibiotic resistant bacteria get out into the air and water and soil. That has an impact in public health. Uh, they should be banned in my opinion. How has it changed uh, the landscape of rural America in terms of the health of our communities, um, in terms of the numbers of people in them, you know, the thriving of local businesses, those sorts of things? Yeah, you know, I love to take country roads. I like to stay off the interstate. And I, my husband and I do a lot of traveling. We try to visit farms and farm markets wherever we go. And there has been a real decimation of rural communities. And, you know, I, you, you drive into one of these rural towns and their downtowns are boarded up. Uh, you know, the, the small farms, the fabric of rural communities has been destroyed by this industrial exploitation. Uh, you know, maybe families are shopping at a local stop and shop uh, or a Casey's store. There isn't really good food to be had. You know, we talk about these food deserts in urban environments. There are food deserts in rural environments too. So you say, well, where does somebody go to get the kind of food that I recommend for good health? And it's, it's just not to be found. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very sad. You might see like a Dollar General store, you know, the big signs of exploitation, I think. But the boarded up downtowns, that loss of social cohesiveness, that's not good for public health. So many were so excited about the uh, beginnings of the organic movement that it was going to be a revival of the rural farms in America. And I'm wondering if, if we've succeeded in that or has this been um, kind of one of the failures of organic that it's, it's become so big? Well, in terms of the, the, um, the viability of small farms, I don't think it's a failure of organic, really. It's a failure to hold accountable those industrial practices that are making it impossible for smaller farms, 
organic or not, to survive. So I'll give you just a couple of examples. I did an interview with Rob Fox in Iowa uh, just last year, and he was saying that because the surrounding farms in his area are spraying GMO corn and soy, and he is the victim, really, of drift, especially from dicamba that's being used on soybeans, uh, that is prohibiting him or not allowing him to grow peppers for his community in the quantity that he wants to produce. So whose fault is that, right? That's an injustice. And, uh, you know, Dave Vetter, he's another great example, organic farmer in Nebraska. He's got grain place foods. And, you know, he's trying to grow whole grains, organic whole grains, the kind of food that I would recommend. We want more Dave Vetters on the land because he's keeping us healthy, he's keeping the land healthy, he's keeping, he's maintaining water quality, he's got a lot of different grains, so that biodiversity that we all value in terms of public health and resiliency. Uh, he's, you know, he's struggling because he's had drift problems. And why is it up to the organic farmer to have to maintain a buffer? There was a peach farmer in southern Missouri who lost his ability to grow peaches. He sued. Uh, it was, you know, the Monsanto slash Bear that was in court. Uh, they had to pay the Bader Peach Farm. So, okay, so he walked away with a settlement. But what does that mean for the local community? Are we supposed to import peaches then from another state? That doesn't really make sense when we're thinking about uh, local resiliency. You know, we saw this with COVID. We see this more with climate change. We need to, I think, relocalize much of our food and agriculture system. So if a person can't produce the food to feed their community because of drip, because of spray drift that's being used on industrial farms, that's a problem. Uh, I interviewed a gentleman in Arkansas who had to sell his entire bee operation. So no more local honey. Uh, no bees to do the pollination. Why? Because dicamba drift from GMO soy. It's also used, I think, on GMO cotton. And that would be more of an issue down in Arkansas. So this dicamba drift is, is harming his ability, actually prohibiting him from having his honeybee operation. So who loses there? Not only the local farmer, but the local eater, the local economy, as you mentioned earlier about the cohesiveness of small rural communities, with him not being there, we just lost a farmer. We just lost a family. We just lost that community cohesiveness because of that drift. And personally, I would love to see class action lawsuits where not only farmers, in, where farmers come together as well as the eaters that lose out because they've lost access to say, Rob Fox's peppers. That's that is not just Rob Fox's problem. That becomes the eater's problem because they can no longer access those healthy red, red peppers that I recommend that people eat for preventing chronic diseases. You know, dicamba is so different because it's much more volatile than, I mean, we were having drift problems before with just, um, we have them with glyphosate and 2,4-D, but dicamba... If you spray any time after the morning, um, you know, when it's a little bit hot, it really increases its volatility. And, you know, I just find it so astonishing how anybody can just go out there and buy it, you know, and, and it, how much um, paperwork and um, everything that we have to go through as organic farmers to prove that we're not using these substances. And then the farmers that are using the horrible substances can just go buy them. It's, it's so backwards to me. It's totally backwards. And then, of course, I've met farmers through the Moses Conference. I think in you know earlier conversations we've had, I, I spoke about the my personal education really just took off when I served on the Moses Board, the Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service. Um, that Moses Board, did I say that right? Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Services, yeah. Um, those farmers on that board and at that meeting taught me so much about the integrity of those small organic farmers. 
They are such keen observers. They are such careful stewards of their land. And they share, you know, they share information with each other so that they can all be successful. It's a much more cooperative kind of mentality than I have witnessed in an industrial system. Uh, so I forget what the question was that we originally, that we're, where I went down that tangent. Oh, I just remember talking to you in the past and you had said, I wish I could purchase, you know, I was saying how unfair it is for the organic farmers to have to do so right. much to prove that they're farming well. And you had talked about how wonderful it would be to know when you purchase something, tell me everything that's been used in order to produce this product. Right. And that should be what the organic label is helping us do. And I think with the hydroponic berries, when I learned about that, thanks to the Real Organic Project, I had no idea, actually, when I went into my local grocery store that if I bought berries there, I, first of all, I had no way of knowing if they were hydroponically produced. They had the organic seal, so that was good enough for me, right? And then thanks to the Real Organic Project, I learned, oh, wait, some of those organic berries might be hydroponically produced and I, I want my berries to be soil raised for so many reasons and nutritionally, of course. But uh, yeah, that whittling away of what that organic seal means, it hurts every organic farmer who's doing it right. And I know nobody wants to buy conventional food. They want things to be more transparent in, under the organic seal. Europe's solution to that has been the creation, well, and these add-on labels, so organic is the base, they were organizations that existed before the EU organic law, and they have just continued on improving and creating higher standards. Do you feel like something like that is needed here in the U.S.? Are well, we there? Well, continual improvement is part of the USDA's organic definition, right? So one would hope that we would continue to see that. You know, it takes an active, uh, it, you know, what was that quote about democracy? That it's like a muscle and you have to use it. So we all have to be involved and protect. We, we can't rest on our laurels and say, okay, we've got a great system now. We can, you know, go get a video and a six pack and sit back and say everything's going to be fine. We have to stay involved and that takes effort. And uh, that's just part of keeping good quality food on the table. And it's worth it. If we can, not everybody has that freedom to have the time or energy uh, or know-how. So, you know, we, we have to lift each other up, I think. Yeah, that was the creation of the Real Organic Project came out of that movement, farmer-led movement for reform uh, against the certification of hydroponics, and they were unsuccessful. So um, they, they realized, okay, we need to continue to work for reform in the USD USDA, which is why they're an add-on, but we can't wait. We need to be able to distinguish those soil-grown blueberries from the hydroponic ones that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do you think uh, there will be confusion in the marketplace? Uh, and if so, um, is that okay? Because maybe we're talking about this. What does this mean? You know, why is this label here? Or do you think it's just going to make people kind of turn away from organic because they're overwhelmed? People are already overwhelmed and misinformed. And, you know, the, the industry, the ag agribusiness that uses chemicals and um, who is exploiting, who the, the agribusinesses that really exploit land and people, uh, they're okay, I think, with the confusion. Uh, there was just actually, I think I shared with you the food and f the Alliance for Food and Farming and how, you know, they, they bring dietitians to farms and then the dietitians go out and help kind of spread their messages that, you know, you don't have to invest more in organic, that it might not mean what, you know, all the good things that we, that we know it should mean. So it's a real conundrum, Lindley, in that uh, we have a lot of education. Not only do we need to preserve and protect the integrity of the organic label, but we have to make sure that our messages are loud and clear about what organic really means. And so when we hear messages coming from the industry that, oh, you know, don't worry about pesticide residues, uh, we have to expand the, the discussion to say it's not just what is about 
it's not just what is on my food. It's also about farm worker health and it's also about soil health and water quality. We're not just talking about what's on my plate. It's a much bigger issue. And, you know, right now the organic seal is, it's the best we've got alternatively to the industrial system. And it's why I advocate for organic and it's why I advocate to hold on to that integrity. And for all of the folks in the Real Organic Project and certainly beyond pesticides and other organizations who are fighting to keep that integrity, it's, it's very important that we continue to pay attention and protect it. Let's, let's dive into that healthy soil piece that you mentioned. For eaters, I feel like that is a stretch for them. They're not as educated on um, what the connection to healthy soil might be to the nutrition of their food. Why should they care about that? Well, we're really just learning about those connections, aren't we? You know, looking at the gut microbiome, the microbes that live in our gut, and making those comparisons to, oh, wait, the healthy soil microbes are similar to the healthy gut microbes. And there's this whole world that's opening up to us right now. And we're seeing how microbial health in the soil helps protect crops and helps protect plants and the nutritional value of plant foods. And then just at the same time, we're learning how the integrity of the gut microbiota, the microbes in the gut help protect physical health, mental health, prevent chronic diseases. So under that one health lens again, we see how everything is connected. I feel like I'm just, that was a beautiful answer and I'm like a pop quiz show host or something and you're just hitting them out of the park. Oh, we have a what lot about... more to learn, Lindley. I am, you know, I feel like I'm a novice. Every day there's something new. And, you know, I was on a webinar recently and I heard a gastroenterologist talking about soil microbes. It was the very first time I had ever heard a gastroenterologist talk about soil health, and I thought, bingo, we need much more of this cross-pollination between the disciplines, right? So there's, yeah. there's the study of human nutrition, and we should be communicating with farmers, and we should be communicating with physicians and teachers and you know people who de define or um, put school meals together and helping to understand how we feed children is so important to their long-term health. It's like I said, everything's connected. Yeah, you know, I think that is almost so overwhelming um, how much education there is around food systems. And, you know, for me as an environmentalist growing up, figuring out what a career could be in terms of um, feeling like you're doing something for the greater good, it was a slam dunk farming was because it was connected to so much more than healthy food, right? It was a whole healthy lifestyle and a healthy community. And, um, you know, even hearing that children raised on farms had less immune diseases, right? But it also tied into social issues. You know, it's like, can we, can we work as a community in a fair way? And there are so many, um, you know, labor issues on, you know, the way our current food is raised and, you know, imported food from Mexico with um, workers getting, um, you know, like $10 a day. And so there were so many social justice issues around it. Um, you know, how, how do we uh, create change when it is just such an overwhelming amount of information that needs to come out? Well, uh, I think we need to focus you know, narrow our focus on what is really important to us because there are so many issues and it is so easy to become overwhelmed. So I think for anybody listening, you know, pick, pick the one thing that speaks to your heart that you want to devote your time to. You know, for me, um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, you're an environmentalist. I have I have certainly, as a child, I played outside. I had, I was so privileged to 
you know, have parents that introduced me to the outdoors and allowed me to just, na I, of course, I think kids naturally love the environment. But my parents, you know, early on said, you know, you're not going to watch a lot of TV, you're going to get outside and play. And I think that stuck with me. But I've become much more of an environmentalist, quote unquote, because of my work as a dietitian. And I actually am a, a member of a practice group that focuses on environment um, and, and the humanity of our food system. And there are stories that we hear, um, but only if you're paying attention, they're not frontline, you know, they're not headline stories and they need to be. And I'll tell you a, a farm trick trip that I took that was absolutely devastating to me. And it was down to Immokalee, Florida. And there, of course, is a coalition of Immokalee workers down there who, uh, the Immokalee workers, you know, they're largely an immigrant population. They're migrant farm workers. They don't speak English. They are highly exploited. But pregnant women who work in the fields uh, that are not organic, the industrial farming system sprays them, right? They're out in the field. There's no protection for them. And they deliver children with birth defects. And I remember a story about a little boy, Carlitos, who was born, I think, in 2004 without arms and legs. And it was Agrimart, that was the, um, the industrial firm that... Uh, didn't, I guess, think to care about pregnant women in the field. And I think that Carli Carlitos' story and all the children that are born with birth defects and developmental disabilities because their parents were exposed to these farm chemicals when, when they were in utero, um, even children today, you know, living in California, um, in the Salinas area where they've been exposed to chlorpyrifos, for example, and have experienced brain damage. How long did it take us to get chlorpyrifos? Finally, it's been banned. But what about those generations of kids that are going to suffer for the rest of their lives and the families that suffer along with them? Talk about social injustice. So if you give me a choice between, a, between produce that's been raised with chemicals or without, uh, give me the produce that's been raised without. And you'll hear the industry say, well, you know, organic farmers, they use chemicals too. But e even USDA says that organic produce has significantly fewer residues than the chemically grown produce. So I think it's very important to question who is giving us these messages about our food and farming system. And that, go that falls under the umbrella of media literacy, which is something that I care deeply about. And it's helping people look at the messages that they receive about their food system and question who owns and profits from those messages, how they were crafted, who is delivering those messages and why. There, there's nothing that's happenstance in media. So, you know, right down to who is delivering messages in our, in those media campaigns, it's very important to pay attention to that. Of course, we've seen that in the political system and there's a lot more emphasis on news literacy these days, but those messages, those media messages, they must be analyzed at every step of the way. Yeah, you you really um, got on one that's a personal um, pet peeve of mine, which is that the residues are so small that they don't affect you. And um, maybe that's true, but certainly for the people working in the fields, we know that isn't true. And so um, I just find it so incredibly selfish that, you know, we're willing to purchase something only based on self-interest, whether or not, you know, these chemicals are at a level that will harm us and not thinking about the people that are spraying them or working in the fields after they're being sprayed. That's exactly right. And I like your word selfish, but that's kind of the American way. You know, if you think about who our heroes are and what our whole national narrative has been, it's really one of, you know, the self and the independence, right? The rugged individualism. We do a lot better when we cooperate, uh, when we think about others and live in cooperation with community. It's not just about us. And I think that, you know, in a clinical setting, we are very focused on the individual. We have an individual, you know, care plan. We have an individual diet that that person gets based on their individual illness. 
But when we're looking at a broader community and community wellness to prevent that person from becoming hospitalized in the first place, then we have to look at all of these issues together. And the sooner we start thinking about the farm worker population and the soil health and water quality and climate, even COVID, you know, even our susceptibility, our immune strength, you know, we talked about gut microbes, 70% of our immune system is in our guts. So if we are eating food that is laced with antibiotic residues, if we are eating animals that have been raised with antibiotics, if we are eating produce that has whatever level of residue, that has got to have an impact in our guts. So we have to be thinking about all of these vital connections when we make our decision in the marketplace and to make sure that everyone has the freedom of choice. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, American freedoms and I think we have a lot of illusion of choice in the marketplace. And uh, if you look at Phil Howard's work at Michigan State University, where you know you go into the supermarket, you see all these different brands, and you realize, oh, wait a second, they're consolidating, and all of these different brand names might be owned by one producer. Uh, you know, look at how, look at livestock, for example. You know how many, how few livestock companies are. You know, it's a, it's a global industrial complex. And the individual farmer has very or dying choices really in the marketplace. I have a friend who's a dietitian and a livestock farmer in Minnesota. And part of her struggle is not only getting you know, access to organic feed, of course, it costs more, um, but also the infrastructure to support that small organic family farmer if they have to depend on fewer and fewer places to get that meat um, in slaughtered and inspected. So that's all part of the story too, in how do we make, how do we relocalize and re-regionalize our food systems, I think for greater resiliency moving forward uh, in light of pandemics and which, you know, this present pandemic will not be our last. It's one of those other you know, issues that we can all agree on. And then, of course, climate change, which, which is really facing us down, and we must act quickly. I'm wondering, you know, you wrote, and you just explained here, you wrote to me that uh, industrial organic is an oxymoron for you. And we're looking now at a $60 billion industry. And, of course, we want um, organic over conventional. But I'm wondering if that consolidation... Um, you know, we're at risk of losing something else. Uh, of course, the hot topic right now is that uh, 89 contracts from Horizon were just dropped in the entire states of Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Eastern New York are no longer going to be um, visited by Horizon uh, to, to pick up milk from dairies. So they're getting all their milk now for their regional distribution from kind of the Finger Lakes region in New York. And... Um, I, you know, it's just so representative of the consolidation that's going on in the organic industry and um, maybe what solutions you might have uh, for us to kind of tackle this without, uh, you know, slowing down the growth of organic. Well, you know, Lindley, I'm not an economist. I'm not an agricultural economist, but through a nutritionist lens, I think that we all want the same thing. We want good quality food. We want to produce it in a way that is not going to harm the land and water for future generations. And we want to restore what was lost in our rural communities. And I think it's very important that we develop more relationships and re-regionalize our food system. And there are parts of the country where we see that happening. Uh, you know, we talked about, say, what the pandemic showed us where we were dependent on this industrial system that we saw some collapses in that, where, you know, shelves in big supermarkets were bare and the farmers that were really doing well had much more direct uh, farmer to consumer sales. How do we reestablish that? Um, you know, I, I want to understand more about what has happened with organic dairy farmers and how they are going to survive. What a tragedy. But we all, you know, I certainly would recommend that we 
by the by that organic milk, pasture raised organic milk. That's that's better than the milk that comes from the industrial system. You know where the cows are fed corn, and you know we we talk about visiting farms and how I said that industrial organic was an oxymoron because I think about the organic farms that I have visited. And I think that of all of those farmers who have this deep, intimate relationship with their land and their animals and their customers. And I go to those farms and it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, I, I want to support those farmers. So we have to re-regionalize those those communities that that re, we have to re-regionalize the food system, and um, I guess maybe show more examples of what the industrial farms really look like. I have taken wrong turns in uh, eastern Colorado and western Kansas, and I've ended up in some of these horrific uh, beef cattle CAFOs, for example. And this, it's crazy. It's silent. Uh, there's really not much sign of life. The, the cattle are eating from the trough of grain. And it's, you don't see many people. Uh, it's a totally different environment than if you go to a farm where it's an organic farm and the farmer is protecting the soil and the animal health. And uh, it's the kind of quality food that we want to consume. There's a lot of stuff that we, there's a lot of um, lack of transparency and we need to pull the curtain back on the risks of that industrial system on so many levels. Yeah, you know, you're primarily a nutritionist, but it seems like you've really got um, a lot of this kind of social side of uh, the, the harm from consolidation that's been going on. Um, but, but let's dive into nutrition because that's your specialty. I know when uh, there was, well, not just concern, but that the, that the grazing rule wasn't being followed by a lot of these organic dairies, um, the Washington Post was able to in, just take a look uh, at the difference in, in the nutrition uh, from milk from Aurora Dairy. They did this at a lab in Virginia Tech um, and compared it to um, conventional milk as well as dairies from smaller scale uh, grazing operations. And they saw that the organic milk from Aurora was actually closer in nutrition to conventional milk than it was to the, the grazed, the, the milk that came from cows that are grazed. So um, I guess, you know, what, what don't we know yet about nutrition and, um, and what do we know about um, milk nutrition in terms of uh, the differences that grazing can make? So, you know, if you look at the leader nutrients that you get in dairy, you're looking at, you know, protein, uh, you're looking at calcium, for example, you know, probably the protein and the calcium is going to be pretty similar. But if you look at the, the finer points of the fatty acids in the milk, then you want the, you want the dairy from the pasture raised cow. So the problem is when you go into the marketplace, how do you know? You've got different organic labels. How is the consumer who wants to do the right thing? They've been convinced that pasture-raised meat and dairy are superior because of the differences in the fatty acid composition. How do I know from the label which organic dairy is delivering the superior nutrition? And that's the problem in the marketplace. That's where the trust issue comes in. You know, I have certainly been to Organic Valley Farms. Um, I have seen the dedication among those farmers in terms of keeping that, keeping to that pasture rule. Um, but how do I know how the different labels, what, what do the different labels mean? And if I look at, say, maybe an Organic Valley uh, dairy product versus, say, if I go into Aldi's or if I buy the store brand somewhere or the Horizon brand is on the shelf, you know, I, I don't see those differences teased out. There's no omega-3 uh, requirement on the, on the food, on the, on the nutrition facts panel, and that's one of the problems. Okay, I've got a question for you. Can't they just add omega-3? Oh, add it to the milk, you mean? 
And they do that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that the same? Yeah. Right. Well, I guess that's sort of analogous to eating a poor diet and adding a vitamin supplement, right? I think it's better to naturally have that that nutrient present um, in the way nature intended. It's sort of like um, I don't really, you know, I don't take any dietary supplements. I, I think that we should get our nutrients from food. And ideally, that's the way I want to get it. So yeah, it can be supplemented. You know, we, we have a lot of fortified foods, for example, on the market. Um, that's one way to get the nutrients. And those nutrients are important. But do we want a population that needs to be supplemented because they're, the food that they're eating on the table isn't sufficient, isn't as nutritionally sound as it could be if it was raised differently? I mean, these are the, these are the kinds of questions that I think we all need to answer for ourselves and for our larger community and the farming community. Yeah, and it made me wonder too. I remember Fred Provenza said there's at least 400 different fats in milk, and we're supplementing and measuring this one. Right. Right. So what are we forgetting to put in? Right. We. How do we know? Um, I, you know, how do we have a way of knowing? So unless we have that extra research that's funded by USDA, uh, that goes into not only doing good research but also then having an educational component and subsidizing or supporting the farmers who are producing high quality food. And that's one of my, one of my issues is that farmers who are really taking care of the land and the water and air quality and producing superior quality food, I believe should be subsidized because they are saving us money in the long term by preventing chronic diseases. So farmers are, you know, I always say, whenever I talk to a group of farmers, especially organic farmers, I always say, you are at the base of healthcare. You are the preventive healthcare practitioners. And I so value what you're doing. Um, and I always say, if I'm healthy, it's because I have the farmers at my farmer's market to thank for producing good quality food. Mm, that's great to have such a fan. I, I know that um, you've talked about shopping at the farmer's market, and that's the place where you prefer to get your food. Right. Um, are we beyond the need for a label if, if we can go shop locally? Well, you know, it's so interesting that you bring this up, and I thought of a story that I wanted to share with you. So I live in Columbia, Missouri. It's a college town. There are tons of PhDs here. And I remember having a discussion with one who said, oh, I thought everything at the farmer's market was organic. So I, you know, there is this idea that, you know, maybe you've seen, I remember the Time magazine cover that said local is the new organic. Not really. You know, there are many local farmers at my market that use pesticides uh, and chemical fertilizers. So I don't really want to invest my money where the, I don't want local pesticides either, you know, because that's going to get into my local water and local air and hurt local soil. So I, my gold standard is local and certified organic and real organic project on top of that. There's a farm stand on the side of our road in our community. And uh, if you go up and ask them as a customer, are you organic? They'll say, no, but we're non-GMO. <laughs> what or how are they misleading us with that reply? That is a big area of confusion in the marketplace, isn't it? Non-GMO. So uh, the finer points of non-GMO. Organic is non-GMO by definition, but non-GMO is not organic. And I know that there's a livestock, many livestock farmers actually at my market who would feed organic feed if they could find it and afford it. So the, you know, there's a pressure on the consumer then to continue to, to demand it. But I remember calling um, a local feed store because I wanted to know more about this non-GMO feed that the livestock farmer was using. And I said, do you think that non-GMO feed is sprayed with um, chemicals? And he said, absolutely, it's sprayed. So you might not have a GMO corn or GMO soy that you can rest assured is going to be sprayed with Roundup, glyphosate. It's going to be sprayed probably with, you know, some new version. It's like a, you know, a 2,4-D or dicamba. We've got enlist signs on, you know, in our, on our rural community roads showing us that, yeah, these are enlist soybeans. They're going to be sprayed with additional chemicals. 
Um, so non-GMO means that you're not going to get that, but it's not a guarantee that the farmer isn't spraying his sorghum or milo with atrazine and that's being fed to your local uh, chickens that are producing the eggs. So, you know, we, we want certified organic feed for many reasons. And non-GMO is not as good as organic, but it is a lot cheaper. So for the farmer who's trying to make a living, you can understand why they would be attracted to that non-GMO feed. Because for the largely uninformed consumer, uh, by no fault of their own, you know, where, where are we going to learn this? Uh, the the non-GMO feed is good enough. Uh, they're getting local and they're getting non-GMO. Is it really that much more important to get local and organic? I think so, because I don't want those additional residues in my food, in my water, on, on the soil. Um, but it's it's very confusing. And then if you go into the supermarket, I think I've, you know, relayed stories to you before where, you know, I can go into the, into the nut aisle and I can find certified organic almonds or I can find non-GMO almonds and the non-GMO almonds are cheaper, but there aren't any GMO almonds. So why slap that non-GMO on there and further confuse the consumer? Or you might see a natural label which means absolutely nothing, really. Um, and yet many consumers think that the natural label is even more important than the organic label or means more when actually it doesn't. So we need a lot more consumer education, don't we? Yeah, and I, I have a sister who's just like, oh my gosh, when you know I talk about my work and she's like, I just want to go in there and, you know, trust a label and get the food and get out. And I said, well, great, you know, choose organic, always sits better, you know, cause I'll start talking about some of the problems that are going on in the organic industry. It's always better than the alternative, but I've really seen a need for an add on. And I think one of the mistakes that the non GMO label made was that they didn't make it as an add on to organic. Um, even though of course, um, you know, organic is non GMO, the consumers, we're saying we, you know, we want this information on the package. Um, you know, we lost kind of all of those GMO labeling battles. And because they weren't specifying that they were GMO, there was a, you know, desire in the eating community to put that non-GMO label on there. But in my opinion, they should have made it an add-on so that it was like not so confusing. Um, if we can build off of the work that we've already, you know, our successes in the organic program, um, you know, with another label, I, I have no problem. But when it pulls away from organic, that's when I start to really have concerns. Would you agree with that? Uh, totally. Yeah. And in fact, I've noticed that some savvy organic labels do also include, you know, mention not even without the the add on non GMO label with through the non GMO project, if they're just saying non GMO, um, I think it's really important for consumers to make that connection that organic equals non-GMO because those non-GMO only products cannot slap an organic seal on them. So I think having that organic seal as well as non-GMO really helps with our consumer education piece. Um, but yeah, it's confusing. And I, I, I recall a woman also expressing some concern that they found glyphosate residue in you know, non-GMO bread how could that be? And, and I, I really think it's important to help consumers understand that unless they're organic, you can bank on the fact that lentils and other dried beans and grains are going to be sprayed with glyphosate prior to harvest because it is used as a desiccant. So when you've got this huge farm and you've got, you know, you've got to harvest all on one day and it's all got to be dried, so the farmer is going to spray with that chemical to do that. Again, large farm problem, right? Um, yeah. But it's a, it's a heads up to consumers that just because it says non-GMO does not mean that you're not going to find troubling residues on there. And the other issue with regard to residues that gets back to a point that you made earlier about, oh, you know, there's just a little bit, a little bit of how many. And we never see synergistic testing. So maybe you've got 
two, three, four residues in small quantities. Are they significant? Depends where you are in the life cycle for one. Uh, if you're, if you're pregnant, if you're a child, if you are a woman of childbearing years, I'd say little bits matter a lot more than if you're, you know, my age, for example. So we have to look at the, the life cycle when we have these conversations, but we never test pesticides together and see what kind of synergies where one plus one equals three or four in terms of, of biological harm. We don't, we don't know the answers. There's, there's just so much we don't know. So err on the side of safety, right? Take the precautionary approach and go with that organic seal and then fight to keep the integrity in that label. You know, I first learned about um, the effect of small quantities of substances actually from gardening with uh, compost that had herbicide carryover on it. And uh, the herbicides that they were using, since a lot of the weeds out west here are now resistant to 2,4-D, which is a broadleaf specific herbicide, they were then bringing in these new chemistries that are um, kind of similar to hormones. They were like auxins, which is like a plant hormone, and that's how it was killing the broadleaf, uh, the broadleaf uh, weeds in the, in the pastures. And after the pastures are sprayed, the horses or cattle eat the grass, poop it out, I composted it completely using, you know, the organic uh, methods of like three turns, heating it up to high temperatures, and still that uh, herbicide was present. And it was hurting my garden plants because they're broadleaf as well. And it was in the parts per billion. That's how small the doses are because they were hormone-like. So I'm, I'm curious you know, this, this was just like a farmer's experience of what hormone-like substances can do, um, because if they're around in the smallest amounts, they have an effect. Um, aren't some of uh, a lot of the carriers and inerts and things like that, um, endocrine disruptors and, and things that might affect us at really small doses? Absolutely. And it's so interesting that you bring this up. First of all, we've had the same situation here in Columbia where you know there's there's a, a horse barn and people got manure and you know the the composting facility who was using this thought they were doing everything right but oh they missed that there was this residue so yes it happens um so when i first learned about parts per billion was from a wonderful researcher here at the university of missouri he's since retired fred von Saul. And he looked at bisphenol, which is a, a compound in plastics and or is sometimes in can liners for also. That's where we find it. And he he explained these part per billion levels of biological activity. And there's an old concept in toxicology where the dose makes the poison. And he explained that, yeah, you know, in some in some ways, the dose does make the poison. So let's look at alcohol, for example. The higher quantity of alcohol that you consume, it becomes more toxic. But with endocrine disruptors, with hormones, these teensy-weensy levels, parts per billion, are biologically active. And in fact, if you, you know, if you get hormone replacement or birth control pills, um, we're talking about these teeny, teeny, tiny amounts that are present that are biologically active. And I remember Fred showing this J curve on a graph showing that smaller levels are actually more biologically active than some of the higher levels. So yeah, we, we have to rethink how we once thought about toxicology and include that in any discussion of nutrition and farming getting back to that cross-pollination idea that we cannot operate in silos. We have to talk to each other and better understand how everything is connected. Well, we opened with everything is connected and are closing with everything is connected. I have one last question for you, Melinda. Um, I heard recently that there was a, the, a huge Earth Day protest on the first Earth Day back in the 60s. I don't know if it's 68 or if I even got that right. But it was the, the biggest protest uh, movement that there's ever been, bigger than anything that Greta has done in the last few years or and you know all the people, the movements around her. 
And I just got so depressed that like the largest um, protest movement and, and yet things have only gotten worse for the environment since then, right? Um, Paul Hawken writes about this, the beautiful uh, nonprofit world and, and protest movements as blessed unrest and how we're all working for the same thing because truly everything is connected. But, you know, with the dropping of, of those dairies under the organic label by Horizon in New England, I, I feel sometimes like we're just losing. Um, are we succeeding as an alternative food movement? Um, and if not, how, how do we light up the switchboards? Well, I refuse to think that we're losing, right? <laughs> um, I had a conversation with a wonderful photographer um, who, was, who had done some work on plastics in the ocean, Chris Jordan. He was one of my favorite interviews. And we were talking a lot about grief, which I think a lot of us have felt in the last year. Um, and he said, you know, the flip side of grief is love. And I, I thought, wow, that, what an interesting way to think about that. And I think about what we've lost, you know, in the last year because of COVID and how we've had to disengage from getting together as community, but there's real power in community. And we've learned to do community on Zoom and that's, that's gotta be our stopgap, you know, until we can get together again. But I think we need to teach more about cooperative movements, cooperative businesses, and really fuel that kind of cooperative community. And I, I, I think about in my years of being a dietitian and what people are hungriest for. They are hungriest for connection. And when industrialization comes in, we lose connection. When we lose rural communities, we lose connection. When we have the mindset that it's each man for himself, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, we lose connection and the power of community. So um, we need more of that. And that's where I am going to place my hope for the future. Um, I saw that in action at the, at the Moses conferences. And I think that, I, I don't know if they're going to have an in-person conference this year, but hold, you know, hold on to- I think to, they are. That's what I have heard. They have already rented the space, so they are in. Well, if you're in the Midwest, make it a point to experience what real community feels like. And I'm assuming that there are similar conferences in the Northeast and the Southwest in California. EcoFarm, for example, I think is another, um, is another great opportunity Find your communities, find your kindred spirits. Spirits, don't ever think that you're fighting this by yourself. I think that's when we start entering real sorrow and grief. Know that you're not alone out there. One of the farmers told me that the R in Real Organic Project, if the R was too controversial for some, it, the R should stand for relationship instead. Uh, and I thought that was right on. I because love that. That's really what we've been trying to do is, is bring the organic uh, community back together. Uh, beginning with the farmers, and now there's lots of eaters joining us too. Yeah. So uh, thank you for those words of hope, Melinda. Oh, thank and, you. you know, a lot of the farmers, you know, when industrial agriculture is so big in the U.S., and it's like, of course, it's happening, you know, to organic now. And um, I, I have been reaching out to other areas of the world and talking about the organic movement there. And and one of the really inspirational things has been cooperative land ownership. And I think we need to start doing that because it is such a, more of it, um, it, it is the biggest barrier for beginning farmers, uh, you know, if they don't have land in their family to, to get started. And so we need to be walking down that cooperative road for, for land ownership as well. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, Melinda. Thank you so much, Lindley. It has been such an honor and privilege to speak with you. And thank you for your involvement in the Real Organic Project and for bringing people together with the same hopeful spirit. Well, I appreciate you for all that you do too. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to the conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 59. Please join us next time when our guest is Francis Tickey, 
a real organic dairy farmer from Fairfield, Iowa, and a former member of the National Organic Standards Board and an executive board member of the Real Organic Project. To support this podcast, become a real friend of the Real Organic Project by visiting realorganicproject.org and making a recurring donation. See you next time.